All right, well, our text this evening is, I'm sure it'll be a surprise to you, Exodus 20. And I'd like to read, I think, I just want to read verses 8 and, and part of 9 to just get the idea that we're going to be, again, considering this evening. Next week, we're going to get into how to keep the Sabbath holy from what we're told in God's Word. But again, the Lord says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath is, excuse me, the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. I guess I broke into verse 10. Okay. So that's what we were considering right now, and we have been considering for the past um, couple of Lord's Days. And uh, this evening, I, I, I believe we will conclude the idea or the change of day. And, um, you know, a lot of this has been a bit more uh, doctrinal, and the application hasn't been as great. We will focus on application when we get to how this day is to be observed. And again, as I said before, even if we don't agree that um, there is such a day that we need to keep, I think we would all agree that doing the things that we're supposed to be doing on the Lord's Day would be a great blessing to do, uh, not just on that day, but every day, but particularly on this day when the Lord gives us uh, the commandment to set aside everything else that distracts us so we can focus on these things. Well, this morning, remember, we were looking at the arguments of the Seventh-day Adventists for keeping the weekly Sabbath on Saturday, and their arguments were these, that the New Testament never speaks of the Sabbath on any other day than Saturday, that Jesus and Paul kept the Sabbath on Saturday, that Jesus never questioned the Jewish leaders on the day it was to be observed, but rather on how it should be observed, and that this is what we should expect because this is really what the fourth commandment says. Now, our reply to that, what we've seen so far is this, that the New Testament actually does speak about a change of day. That's what we're going to look at this evening. Uh, not explicitly, remember, but clearly enough for us to be able to see it. Okay? Secondly, that Jesus kept the Sabbath on Saturday... And he didn't argue against it because his work was not yet completed. The day had not yet changed. So the day to observe the Sabbath when Jesus was on the earth was, in fact, on Saturday. That Paul went to the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath on Saturday because he wanted to evangelize the Jews. They were gathered together for, you know, for worship on the Sabbath, and there was no better time, really, to come. Plus, remember, Paul was a rabbi, and so he had an open door to open the Scriptures and to preach Christ to them. And that the fourth commandment, remember, does not specify a particular day of the week to keep as the Sabbath. It simply tells us to work six days and rest on the seventh. Now, that doesn't mean that the day we are to observe as the Sabbath is up for grabs and that we can choose any day we want to. It means that God has to show us from outside the commandment which day we are to keep as a Sabbath because the day, remember, needs to be the same for all of us so that we can all meet together for worship as the Scripture reminds us, the author to the Hebrews, that we are not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Now, sometimes this can get kind of complicated, right, because... Um, you know, we, we're, we're spending all these weeks trying to figure out what all this means. But it gets complicated for a couple of reasons. And the first we saw this morning, I just want to say this by way of reminder, that the Lord doesn't, I think in many cases, not in all certainly, but in many cases, doesn't just give us one verse that summarizes everything and says, here, do this, you know, or here, this is the truth you are to, to hold to. But He takes almost like he takes the picture and turns it into puzzle pieces and spreads them throughout the scriptures so that we have to gather up the pieces and put them together to see what the whole picture is like. You know, we call that systematic theology, don't we? That's, um, you know, we're, we're digging into the scriptures to see what it says on one topic and all the different places it talks about that particular topic. I actually enjoy that. That's uh, I think that's a very interesting study. But the other reason why it takes sometimes a lot of work to see the whole picture as, as we're doing is because there are so many objections that have been raised against virtually everything that the church has believed. And we, we've seen that 
to be the case in the instance of the Sabbath. What we are looking at can really be quite simple, you know, as far as the change of day. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. The New Testament church met on the first day of the week, and they observed that as the Christian Sabbath. Well, there's the whole case right before you. But again, we want to see this with a little bit more detail because of the objections that are raised. So let's put on the hat, as it were, of an apologist, because that's essentially what we're doing. Remember, being an apologist doesn't mean just proving the existence of God or that the Bible is His Word, but we also need to prove everything the Bible teaches because of all the debate that surrounds these things. Well, this evening we're going to consider, again, why we believe the first day of the week is the day we are to observe the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day. Remembering that the commandment itself doesn't show us the day, but that God has to show us from outside the commandment. Okay, the first argument then I would like to present, I think, is the primary one and the basis upon which the early church kept the first day and continues to the present day to keep the first day of the week as the, as the Christian Sabbath. And that is the fact that Jesus rested from his work of the new creation on this day. This is the day Jesus entered into his rest. Now, that may sound strange. I hope it doesn't sound strange because, um, you know, that is something we have looked at, but it has been a little while. The Lord actually tells us in his word that there are two creations, okay, two creations in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the, the seas and the dry lands. He separated the waters. He created the birds. He created the fish. He created the land animals. And lastly, of course, he made man. He did this in six days, and he rested on the seventh. Now, the first Sabbath was actually instituted as a memorial to that creation. We read in Genesis 2, verses 2 through 3. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, it's on the basis of the creation week that God commanded his people to keep the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. At least as far as we can trace it again, there may be some variations when he brought them out of Egypt and so forth. It, it may have been based on his redemption. We don't know that it was still you know, correlating to this, but it's, it's quite possible that it was. But again, the Old Testament Sabbath, we can say at least this much, was certainly originally based on the work of creation. But God also tells us about another creation in the Bible. And it was necessary that there be a new creation because of what happened to the original creation, to the old creation. When the fall took place, the old creation was destroyed. Okay? Not absolutely, I mean, because essentially that's what this is, the old creation. But it was no longer good. Okay? It, as a matter of fact, Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 4.23 that the world had returned back to the chaos it, it had once come from. He says, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. He essentially represents the world because of the corruption, because of the fall, to have returned to the chaos that it once was. Remember how it was, it was described at the beginning. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the, the earth was formless and void, and you know, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then in the next six days, we see the description of how God brings order and how he brings light to the creation, okay? But sin reversed all of that. It, it turned this orderly universe that was good into that which was not good. But we know that God had a plan to redeem the creation. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 20 through 21, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. By the way, the, the creation of the new heavens and the earth is essentially 
the, uh, the old creation being set free into this, you know, this uh, liberty, as it were, this freedom of the glory of the children of God, and it takes place at the same time our, our glorification takes place uh, on that last day. Now, that is only possible because of what God had purposed to do through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Colossians 1, verses 19 through 20, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, that is in Christ, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. I want you to notice that the purpose of Christ coming into the world was, was not simply to redeem the elect, but it was to redeem all things, to redeem the creation itself. So Jesus' work not only redeems us, but it redeems the creation. And again, that is the reason why one day there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth. In Christ, all things have been made new again. Now, the Bible sometimes even represents the, the new creation as having already come in the same way that we sometimes are represented, such as by the Apostle Paul, as already being seated in heaven with Christ, or on another occasion, we are already glorified with Him because Christ has done it. It is so absolutely certain to take place that it's spoken of sometimes in the past tense. Now, that's why Paul tells us that if we are in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith in Him, that we are already a part of the new creation. We are already new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, literally in the Greek, he says, a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. In Christ, all things are made new. Not all people, you know, only the elect. But the creation itself is redeemed by Christ. Now, the point I'm making here is that there are two creations. And if the work of the old creation was commemorated by a special day of rest to commemorate it, how much more should the work of the new? And that's essentially what the author to the Hebrews is telling us in the meditation we read earlier when he says in Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 10, Therefore, there remains a Sabbath day of rest for the people of God because the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. I hope as we go over this again and again and rehearse these ideas, you're beginning to see how all of this fits into this passage. The author to the Hebrews is reminding us that the reason why a Sabbath remains, and remember a Sabbath is a day of rest that pictures the eternal rest that we are to be striving to enter into. The reason why that exists is because there's still a possibility of entering into that eternal rest. Even after Adam and Eve failed to, to bring us into that rest because of the fall, the possibility still exists because of this one who has entered into his rest, because Jesus has accomplished the work of the new creation and has entered into his rest as our forerunner. Remember, because Jesus has entered it, if we are united to him, we too will enter into that rest. Now, the day that he entered into that rest, the day that his humiliation ended, was a day that he rose from the dead the first day of the week, and so that is the day that we are to observe. Now, I already showed you, secondly, that God showed us in the Old Testament that such a day would come, where the New Covenant Church would rejoice in a particular day. That would be a day of rejoicing for them. We read in our call to worship in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Now, thankfully, we have the New Testament to explain what, what this means. And we know that what it's referring to, the rejection of the stone by the builders, is, of course, the rejection of Christ by the leaders of Israel. And it becoming the cornerstone is the day of his resurrection. And we know that because of what Peter says in his sermon uh, that he preached to the crowd that gathered around because of the healing of the lame man. We read this in Acts 4, verses 8 through 11. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done, excuse me, this is their defense before the uh, Sanhedrin, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So again, this is talking about the rejection of Christ. It's talking about the resurrection of Christ, the day he becomes the chief cornerstone. But let's not forget, the psalmist also tells us that that day in which he becomes the chief cornerstone is, was going to be a day of rejoicing for the new covenant church. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So it is a day in which we are to meet and rejoice in the Lord's work of redemption, in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that was the acceptance by the Father of what Jesus has done. And in His resurrection, Basically, we know that we are saved. We know the Father has accepted His sacrifice because He was released from death. Now, this day was further set apart by our Lord Jesus Christ Himself as a day of rejoicing by various things Jesus did on this day. Okay, it was on this day that He first appeared to His disciples. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, remember. Luke writes, and behold, two of them, this is Luke 24, verses 13 through 15, and behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Now we know that they didn't recognize him, but we do know that just before he vanished out of their sight, the Lord removed, as it were, the veil that was over their eyes. They, they recognized who he was, and then he, he vanished. But he did appear to them. He later appears to ten of his apostles on the same day, with, uh, of course, Judas having gone his way, and uh, Thomas not being present. We read in John 20, verses 19 and 20, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus earlier said to his disciples in the upper room discourse, John 16, verses 21 through 22, Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. Okay, the day of Christ's resurrection was to be a day of of joy and a day of rejoicing. You know, I don't know how often we think about it, but it was also on the first day of the week that Jesus poured his spirit out at Pentecost. We read in Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 16, and when you read Leviticus 23, it can be kind of difficult to understand what's, you know, which festivals are being referred to here, but it's actually referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where the Passover is taking place, and then how long after that Pentecost is taking place, and as you know, Jesus was crucified before Pentecost was in, I mean, not Pentecost, but the, um, the Passover. 
He celebrated the Passover, he was crucified, and then, of course, Pentecost comes 50 days later. But this is where we get that in Leviticus 23. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheave of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Okay, that's 49 days. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. One commentator writes this, the festival of Pentecost was set by God to be celebrated 50 days after the Sabbath that occurred during the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Therefore, Pentecost always came on the first day of the week, inaugurating a new week. And I think it's interesting that um, as the Lord has set things up, that he ordained that this feast would be on the first day of the week, foreshadowing the day that his son would rise from the dead, which would bring about the promised blessing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on the day of Pentecost in order to build his church. Now, again, I'm just simply pointing out that there are differing ways that the Lord is distinguishing this day. Now, this was also the day that Jesus distinguished, you know, by visiting John on the Isle of Patmos to give him that vision, to warn him of the judgment. By the way, that's the book of Revelation that, we, that he would soon pour out on the Jews. That's the interpretation that I favor, that he might warn his church. We read in Revelation 1 verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now again, the Lord's Day. What is the Lord's Day? Well, it's the day that belongs to the Lord in a very special way. The day that he has set apart to be his day. That adjective, if you remember, I already told you about, is used only twice in the New Testament. And in both cases, it is used to describe something that is very close to the Lord. Something very near and dear to him the Lord's Day, and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, it commemorates His death. The Lord's Day commemorates His resurrection. So on the first day of the week, the day of His resurrection, He appears to John to give him this warning. And then finally, and I think this is very important, this was the day the early church actually met <laughs> together for worship. Okay? So we can build this argument, but if we don't see any examples of it actually being followed, we might question whether that's actually the way they viewed it. But, but it is, in fact, the way they viewed it. We read in Acts 20, verse 7, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, and remember breaking bread is often simply a, what do you call it, is a synecdoche the right term, where you use a part for the whole? Their worship was often referred to as breaking bread. Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight, and you know the rest of the story, Eutychus falls and so forth. But the fact is, they were gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, where he writes to the Corinthian church, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Now, if we were to look carefully at this language, we might first come to the conclusion Paul is simply telling them on the first day of the week, just set aside some money and, and that money, you know, um, well, set it aside for the saints, the, the saints in Jerusalem. But then he goes on to say, do this so that no collections will be made when I come. So the idea is you are to set aside that portion and to give it on the first day of the week. The purpose of this particular offering was to be a collection for the saints that were struggling in Jerusalem and, um, you know, to help relieve their, their needs. But I want you to notice that the first day of the week they would be gathered. This would be the time to do it because they're already gathered together. This would be an appropriate thing to do because it's an act of mercy, and we're going to see that that is appropriate to do on the Lord's Day. And um, <clears throat> notice as well that this was not just the practice of the Corinthians. This was also the practices, uh, excuse me, the practice of the churches of Galatia. 
concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. And I don't think it's, you know, a, a stretch to say, you know, the, the fact that, that worshiping the Lord and observing the first day of the week as the Christian Sabbath being the universal practice of the church from the apostolic time to the present, you know, doesn't carry any weight. Now, if that's all we had, then we might question it. But if we see it, you know, if we see the, the theological reason for it, and we see the early church actually practicing it, then when we add that to the biblical revelation, I think we see that historically the church has been convinced that the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead and entered into his rest, having finished the work of the new creation, is the day that we are to celebrate and observe the fourth commandment, which again Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount will never pass away as long as the heavens and the earth endure. It's something we still need to keep, but when are we going to keep it? Well, we keep it on the day when Jesus entered into his rest in order to commemorate the Christian Sabbath. Now, you know, it's interesting. Calvin, John Calvin, believed the evidence to be so strong. He actually considered that worshiping on Saturday was an implicit denial of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something, again, the Reformed churches have looked at and believe is, is compelling. And it, even if we didn't have that argument, we still have the example of the early church worshiping on the first day of the week, and we have the arguments for the continuance of the Sabbath. So having now seen that the Sabbath continues and that it is to be observed on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, okay, today, the Lord's Day, next week we're going to begin to look at how we are to keep the Sabbath holy. And by the way, you know, the, the only thing I would say that the Sabbath would require us to do on that day that we wouldn't do on other days is ceasing from work and ceasing from worldly recreations so that we can devote ourselves to the Lord. But everything else we can do on that day are things we should be doing on other days as well, such as worshiping, doing acts of charity, of mercy, and necessity, and things of that, of that nature. So it, the good part about it is, again, if we're looking for an excuse to spend more time with the Lord, God not only gives us an excuse, He gives us a command, and that's the ultimate excuse, to say, I don't have to do this today. I can focus on the Lord, and that's what I really want to do. Well, let's, um, let's just bow for a moment of silent prayer and ask the Lord to um, apply this, and uh, then we'll close with a hymn. Um, so let's pray.